These are the notes on ionic bonds. Now we're getting into a new unit on bonding. Remember that in atoms, the charges need to balance. So as we've seen so far, the number of protons always equals the number of electrons. So you might have been led to believe that, oh, so it's interchangeable. If you know the number of protons, then you always know the number of electrons. Some people even come to think that the atomic number on the periodic table, this is not true though, let me just preface this, is the number of electrons. No, it's not. The atomic number is only one thing. It's the number of protons. Just sometimes that matches the electrons if you have atoms. But now we're gonna see what happens when you don't have atoms. What if you have something different? Remember energy levels. Remember that energy level one fills first. That is alpha-bow followed by two, followed by three, they fill in order because electrons would like to be closer to the nucleus. That is a lower energy level that is more stable. They're lazy. They prefer to be in that location. They would only be at a higher energy level if the one below them is filled, right? So what that means is the electrons that are valence, that are on the outside of the atom, well, those are the ones that are exposed to the outside world. The other electrons, the inner electrons, are not exposed. They're protected. That is all part of what we like to call the inner atom. That includes the nucleus and all the inner electrons. Excuse me. The nucleus and all the inner electrons. Then you've got the valence electrons hovering on the outside. Well, those are the ones that reach out like arms. Those are the ones. They're involved in any interactions that atom has with the outside world. Now we get to the octet rule. It's also called the rule of octaves, like in music. Okay, like do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Okay, so the octave rule is that most elements would like to have eight valence electrons. It's not even like they would like to have that. It's almost like they must have that. The big problem is that most elements do not have that. In fact, only really the noble gases have an octet. And not even helium has a true octet, but it has a full energy level. So really, if you're not a noble gas, well, you're kind of out of luck. If you're an element and you're not a noble gas, wow, I pity you. You've got a lot of work to do. The noble gases, they're all set. They've got it made. They've got the electrons they need. They don't want any more, and they don't have to do anything. Every other element is not so fortunate. Every other element has to do something about their lack of an octet. And so what they have to do is beg, borrow, and steal to get that octet by hook or by crook one way or another. They sometimes get it by gaining electrons, and they sometimes get it by losing electrons. Look at the Lewis dots for various elements. Remember, we only really show valence electrons normally if we're in the S block or in the P block. So that is all that is shown here, okay? And we're not showing the seventh period either. We're just down to radon there, if you notice. So notice that the ones on the right, except for helium, always an exception, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, they all have eight. The ones just next to them, starting with fluorine on the top, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine, they all have seven. Ooh, that's close to eight. That is really, really close to eight, but it's not eight. And so because they are so close, but not quite there, those elements are the most desperate to become a noble gas and they can do it pretty easily. Just grab one electron from somewhere, okay? And then the ones next to them, starting with O on the top, that's oxygen. Well, they all have, notice, six, okay? So if you go down the oxygen family, they all have six. And if you go down the next one over, nitrogen, and on the top, well, they all have five. And then if you go over to carbon, that's four. Go over to boron, that's three. Beryllium, that's two. And lithium, that's one. 
So notice that the valence electrons follow a very simple pattern. There is no reason that you should ever get confused about valence electrons. As long as you count from the left for one and two and count down from eight on the right, you will get them right. And remember, we don't really do valence electrons for the whole D block, for the whole F block. And then of course, yes, you do have to remember helium is an exception. Notice that helium has two electrons together, whereas beryllium has two electrons on opposite sides. That is important because that determines bonding. So essentially, some elements are really, really close to having an octet, and some elements are very far, very, very far from having an octet. Having one electron, well, how are you gonna gain seven? It turns out that just is not gonna happen. I hate to break this to you, lithium, sodium, potassium, the ones we saw in the demo in our last lab, it is not happening for you guys. There is no way you are ever going to gain seven more electrons, especially with the effective charge of the inner atom being positive one, come on. So what they do instead to get their octet is kind of sneaky. Instead of trying to get up to the next octet, they try to drop back down to the previous octet. Because remember, before you get to 11, well, isn't there 10? So underneath sodium, which is number 11, isn't there neon inside it? Doesn't that mean that, ne that sodium, excuse me, has a perfect electron configuration just underneath its one valence electron that is out remotely? Yes. So why did sodium melt into a ball, burst into flames, and explode in the demo, in the video you got to see? It's because of that lone electron. Once it gets rid of that lone electron, well, sodium becomes kind of harmless. Sodium is really dangerous when it's got that electron, but once it's lost the electron, it's pretty safe. In fact, haven't you gone for a swim in the ocean? Have you ever gone for a swim? Well, there is so much sodium in the ocean. There are sextillions of sodium ions in the ocean, and all they do is float around, don't do anything. The only time they ever do anything is if the water evaporates and then you might get a little salt deposit forming. So sodium is extremely dangerous when it is an atom, but once it's lost that electron, that valence electron, well, we can't really call it an atom anymore, can we? Because if you lose an electron, then you don't have equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Your charges do not balance, therefore, boom, you are not an atom. So we're gonna see things now that are not atoms. And for things like fluorine and chlorine, well, pretty easy, just pick up one electron. But then you're not an atom because now you've got more electrons than protons, right? You've got a charge also. And then what about lithium and sodium? Well, they can each lose their electron, but then you've got more protons than electrons and that's not balanced either. And you're not an atom and you have a charge. That's the cost. The cost they have to pay is a charge. That is the penalty for doing this. So remember, every element on the periodic table would love to have an octet like those precious noble gases, but if you're not born with it, you have to find it. You have to work for it. You have to get that electron or lose an electron to be like a noble gas. One way or another, what we find in the real world is that elements bend over backwards, do whatever they have to do to pretend to be noble gases. That's essentially what almost every atom is doing when it is in a compound. So some elements are very close, like we said, look down and to the right, fluorine has seven out of eight. Some elements have already got it, like AR, argon, that's the lazy element, doesn't need anything. And then others are very, very far from it, like let's say magnesium, Mg, it only has two. Notice, by the way, I'm putting the Lewis dots on different sides for the magnesium, top and bottom, instead of left and right. That does not matter. As long as those are not put next to each other like a pair, it really doesn't matter which of the four sides you put them on, as long as they're separated. Up on the right, see aluminum, it's got three. 
that's a ways to go. To get up to eight, what would you need? Oh, five? Pfft, forget it, aluminum. Hate to break it to you, aluminum. You're not getting five. And then there's carbon. Ooh, carbon's right in the middle, right? It's got four. It's got four, it needs four. It's kind of halfway there. So it's interesting. How are these guys all gonna wind up having some kind of octet? Well, they do it in different ways. They make different kinds of bonds. The bonds are really just ways of getting an octet. One way or another, either getting something that resembles an octet that argon already has. And that is why noble gases actually stay out of bonding. They don't get involved in bonding. You have to do some extreme things to get a noble gas to bond. They can do it in a laboratory. They can force them. But otherwise, in the real world, you're not going to see noble gases forming bonds because why should they? The first kind of bond we're going to learn about is called an ionic bond. An ionic bond happens when you get one element that, let's say, needs to lose an electron and another element, let, let's say, needs to gain an electron. We'll get into the more technical way of talking about this in the next notes. And so this is what happens. We've got Na. What is Na again? Sodium. The reason it's Na is because it used to be called natrium. Okay, that's where the Na comes from. And Cl is chlorine. Well, sodium only has one valence electron. Chlorine needs one, so I think you can probably guess what's about to happen. The electron from sodium is taken by chlorine. Now, technically, this is not the real way that it actually occurs. There's a process by which that occurs. And I'm just showing this, that that's how it ends up. Okay, so really, it doesn't go directly from the sodium to the chlorine. It's a little more complex. But essentially, what winds up happening is chlorine now has an octet. Yes, it's made it. Does sodium have an octet? Yes. Why? Because remember, underneath an 11 is a 10. Underneath that valence electron, if you get rid of that, bing, one electron, there's the 10 electrons of neon. Now, I'm not showing them here because they were not shown in the Lewis dots. Now, both of these are now considered ions. Why? Well, guess why? Because chlorine just gained a pro, uh, sorry, chlorine just gained an electron. An electron has a negative charge. So chlorine picked up that negative charge. It now has a negative charge. <clears throat> Sodium lost the electron. This is a little bit harder to understand. So if you subtract a negative one, what is zero minus negative one? Think about it for a second. Zero minus negative one. Well, subtracting negative one is like adding one. So now we've got a positive one charge. So sodium now has a positive charge. Now that sodium has a positive charge and chlorine has a negative charge, well, we change the name for chlorine. We call it chloride now. When it gets a charge, we change the ending to ide. Now they stick together because remember, opposites attract, not just metaphorically like couples that are very different, that like each other. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about literally, electrostatically, Coulomb's law, opposites attract. So now that those two have charges, they're going to stay together. They're stuck. So that is the cost. If you want to pretend to be like a noble gas chlorine, well, here's your penalty. You're going to be stuck with a charge. So you're never going to float around free like argon. You're going to be stuck to something forever. You're going to be stuck to the sodium ion. And not just one sodium ion. We're going to see it's a little bit worse than that. If you want to see which electron we're talking about, well, in sodium, the valence electron is 3s1. So you notice in this notation, they're showing the spins of the electrons with up and down arrows. So we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then 3s1. That is the electron, the, three, the 1 from the 3s1, whoosh, taken by the chlorine. Chlorine can't really get those other electrons. They're down deep in the atom. Those are inner electrons. The only one that is available is the valence electron. Chlorine, on the other hand, the electron orbitals are shown in reverse. That's so that they're facing each other. So uh, don't worry about it too much, but the point is it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. Oh, 
five isn't good. Odd numbers for electrons is never good. Oh, but what if we could make that a six by taking that one electron? Boom, that's a noble gas electron configuration. So then chlorine is gonna wind up with 18 electrons, but it still only has 17 protons. 18 negatives, 17 positives. So 17 minus 18, negative one. Sodium, on the other hand, originally had 11 protons, 11 electrons, but now it's lost an electron. So it has 11 protons minus 10 electrons equals positive one. So sodium now has a positive one charge. Chlorine, which we now call chloride, has a negative one charge. Don't ask me why we don't change the ending of sodium because there's no logical reason why we don't. We just don't do it for the positively charged member. This leads to what we call an ionic bond. On the side of this picture, you can see those columns. Those are ionic Greek columns from the island of Iona, I think, Ionia, maybe not. Maybe I better look that up. Anyway, too late. Um, so sodium now has a name, it's a type of ion. Chlorine, now chloride, has a name, it's a type of ion. Sodium is called the cation. Chloride is called the anion. You really, really need to know the difference between cations and anions. You absolutely need to be able to tell me the difference between them without fail. So there's a super easy way, another one of those mnemonic devices with a silent M on the front to remember which one is which. So don't hate me for this. Oh yeah, in a second. Ions are charged particles. So you're not gonna hate me for this one. Ions are formed when atoms gain or lose electrons. Once you've gained or lost an electron, you are no longer an atom. You are what is called an ion. It's a different term. Kind of like plasma. Remember the definition of plasma was ionized gas. Well, once a gas is ionized, it's no longer gas. Oh, that is related because plasma is loaded with ions. And you know what, that metaphor, I wasn't even intending the connection, but yeah, plasma is really made of ions. I guess I should have thought of that, but even better, there we go. So here's the one you're gonna hate me for. Cations are plussy cats. Not pussy cats, plussy cats. This is a very, very old saying in chemistry, and it's really, really stupid. I know it's stupid, but you cannot forget this one. So if you remember that cations are plusy cats, well, plus means positive. The meow power of pa -pa positive thinking. Okay, so cations are plusy cats. You'll never forget now, guess what? Which one is which? Which one's positive? Cation. Why? Because they're plusy cats. And then what about the other one? Well, that the other one must be the negative one, the anion. Some people like to think an sounds like anti. It's like it's very negative against things, anion. But I think the easiest way is as long as you're sure which one the cation is, then you will never get confused about what the anion is. And I know this is stupid. It's okay. Mnemonic devices are like that. And remember, we had Sally's poor dog flatulating okay, for the electron orbitals. So we had a dog, so didn't we need a cat, really? So here's the cat, okay? There's another dog in chemistry. We'll talk about that later, but too many dogs, we needed some cats. Here we go, cations. So cations are positively charged ions. Sometimes they're plus one, sometimes plus two. It can just keep on going up, plus three, plus four, plus five, anything positive, okay? Anions are negatively charged ions. And again, negative one or negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, it can keep going. The most common ions have charges of plus one, plus two, minus one, minus two. That's a typical charge. But every once in a while, we do see some plus eights, minus eights. Um, it's just less common. So you absolutely have to know the difference between the two different kinds of ions. You need to know this 100%.
So if we're going to talk about ionic bonds, we really need something to compare them to. So ionic bonds are not what we call covalent bonds. We're going to learn about those later. That's the next bond we're going to get into. So what's a covalent bond? Well, look at a water molecule, kind of like a Mickey Mouse head or a decapitated Mickey Mouse head. H2O right there on the top above the line. That is a covalent bond holding those together. And then down on the bottom, we have an ionic bond holding the sodium to the chloride. So now we call that one on top a water molecule. Everybody knows the word molecule. It's a very popular word. It's a great sounding word. One of the better words in chemistry that's really catchy, catches on. So we like to use the word molecule, molecule all over the place. However, it is very important you as a chemistry student realize that salts, NaCl, sodium chloride on the bottom, is not a molecule. Molecules have a very specific definition. We will be getting to that definition in, in later notes. So what can we call the salt then if it's not a molecule? Well, let's call it a compound. Compound is a generic term of two things that are put together. Not as catchy, is it? So we can call lots of things compounds and not all of them are molecules. So we can get away with that. Another way to talk about this one's even worse. <laughs> Should I even mention it? You can call sodium chloride a formula unit, and that's even worse. So molecule, what a great word, but unfortunately with ionic bonds, sorry guys, you can't use it. So you might think, okay, well, great, we got this ionic bond. We got sodium, Na, which has a positive. Which ion is that again? Which ion is that? Oh, the cation. And then over there we've got chloride. Which ion is that? Oh, it's the other one. It's the anion. Oh yeah, and they're stuck together, right, in a salt compound. NaCl, by the way, is your regular everyday table salt. It's the kind of salt that you put on your food. It's the kind of salt that makes up most of the salt in the ocean. When you taste the ocean, it tastes salty. What you're tasting is this kind of salt for the most part. But unfortunately, that's not all there is to it. Because wait a second. Didn't we say the chloride was negative, right? So is it just negative like on the left side or is it negative like all around? And is the sodium just positive on its right side or is it positive sort of like all over, all around? Well, guess what the answer is? Each one of them has an overall charge all around. So what it does is it doesn't just attract one oppositely charged ion, like sodium, which is a cation, attracts chloride, which is an anion. It actually attracts more than that. And so what you wind up getting is, so what you would wind up getting is more like this. What you would get is positive cations, like the Na, the sodium, the purple ones, would be attracting negative anions, the green ones, the chlorides, on all sides, as many as they could grab onto. And the chlorides would be doing the same thing, trying to grab a hold of as many cations as they could get a hold of, as many as they could fit around them. And so what you wind up getting from this situation is what we call a salt crystal or a crystal lattice. This is an alternating pattern of cation, anion, cation, anion, going on and on and on, in every direction, locking them into position. Because now that they're grabbing hold of oppositely charged particles on every side, they really can't move, not very much at all. So look at one of those sodium, one of those purple ones. Notice that it is surrounded by a whole bunch of chloride anions. Those are grabbing onto it, locking it in a little cage, like a little prison. And there's no way it's gonna move out of there, okay? This makes a very interesting set of properties that ionic compounds share. And the great thing about this is this is the same pattern we see with other ionic compounds. As long as they have a plus one and a minus one charge, this is exactly what you see. Even if they have a plus two and a minus two, this is what we see. If you have a plus three and a minus three, as long as the charges are the same number but opposite, then this is the pattern we see. Okay, And so the great thing is that doesn't have to be sodium right there. That could have been potassium ions. 
and that doesn't have to be chloride right there that could be fluoride and it would still make the same pattern so other than the chemical reactivity which is a whole nother thing the properties of ionic compounds fall into nice neat categories they're nice and easy to describe and not just for sodium chloride which is your regular sea salt the kind that you um, find in the ocean it's also table salt it's the kind that you put on your food right not just for sodium chloride but for any ionic compound the structure is basically the same so look at one of those sodium how many chloride ions surround one of those sodium did you say four it does look like four looks like there's four chloride ions surrounding the sodium oh wait a second hold on here do you think that salt crystals are flat do you think that they're thin like paper just one sheet or do you think they have some sort of volume some sort of three-dimensionality well of course you've seen even a small salt crystal is not perfectly flat okay it's actually got a volume to it so it's not just really and we're talking about ions here this is on a microscopic level so you're gonna need more than just one ion to have it be visible to the naked eye so what are we going to see here we're going to see another layer on top of this what will that next layer look like it will look like the same exact thing but shifted over by one let's say to the right it doesn't really matter which way you shift it oh i see so now we've got sodium ions on top of chloride ions chloride ions on top of sodium oh but won't there be another layer yes there's another layer on top of that and guess what there's another layer on top of that and so on and so on until you get to the surface of the crystal so for the most part if you're inside of a salt crystal what you see is this alternating pattern very much like a chessboard or checkerboard okay with a cation anion cation anion diagonal from each other and they're all locked in place so now can you tell me again how many chloride ions would surround that sodium if you think about it as being inside the crystal not on the surface there would be another layer on top of this one one two three four and there's one behind it and then one on top of it oh yeah six so every ion turns out to be surrounded by six oppositely charged ions so it's even worse than what i led you to believe at the beginning they're pegged in place not just on sides but above and below they really can't move this is why ionic compounds are really really rigid things really rigid structures they have no flexibility almost whatsoever so that leads to their properties the properties of ionic compounds come directly from the structure of the ionic crystal lattice so in an ionic bond basically cations are attracted to anions forming a crystal lattice which is hard and brittle those are some of its properties i'll explain why in a moment okay and you never find just an nacl never ever it's always part of a giant matrix and this is just a very small snapshot imagine that this would go on for quintillions sextillions of ions even the smallest little bit of salt you will ever find would have quadrillions of ions so we never just find one sodium one chloride even though that's what the chemical formula leads you to believe it's NaCl makes it sound like it but it's not so ionic compounds ionic bonds form ionic compounds these have a very particular structure and a very particular nature a very particular set of properties so here is a list of ionic compounds and their properties you can think of these properties as things that all ionic compounds share for the most part and it's almost universal if you have an ionic compound it's pretty much going to have these properties number one first thing they have high melting points that means it's really really hard to melt them it takes a lot of energy why well look at we just saw they're locked in their little prisons surrounded by oppositely charged ions what does melting mean that means allowing things to flow past each other well how is that sodium ever going to get out of its little cage how's it ever going to slip past even one of those chlorides it takes an incredible amount of energy we're talking about a blowtorch 
or even one of the most extreme demos that we do in this class. That's about what it takes to melt an ionic compound. Ionic compounds are not molecules. I already told you that. I'm going to explain why later. Just don't call them molecules. They conduct electricity in solution. Well, we will see that even if we don't get to do hands-on labs. You'll see that in videos. That's what the conductivity indicator will show you. When you put them into water, then they will conduct electricity. They conduct electricity when they're molten. Well, that's really hard to show you because you would need to get them to their high melting point first and then above that and then stick a conductivity indicator in. So that's not happening, guys, but you just got to take my word for it. When they're molten, they conduct electricity. These are called, well, chemists got tired of saying ionic compounds. That's five syllables, right? Over and over, it's just too much. So we need a shorter way, shorter way to describe these. Let's call them salts. That's a lot faster. Now, keep in mind what a chemist calls a salt is not necessarily the same thing that you would call a salt. Well, yes, table salt is considered a salt by a chemist, but they also consider ammonium nitrate a salt, as you will see. And that is not something you want to put on your food. Okay, It would actually burn the inside of your mouth and all kinds of things. So we call ionic compounds salts. That's like a nickname. Just keep that in mind. In an ionic compound, the charge is balanced. So in other words, if you have a plus one, well, you need a minus one. If you have a plus two, well, then you need two minus ones. You know what I mean? They need to balance. They are hard and brittle. What that means is they're not flexible. Hard and brittle goes kind of together. If the substance is really hard, that means it won't budge. It won't bend. It won't move in the slightest until you hit it hard enough that it breaks. And then when it breaks, it turns out ionic compounds, they just kind of shatter. They fall apart like glass. Because what you do is you shift over the ions just by one, and then you got positives next to positives, negatives next to negatives. Well, those repel each other, they push each other apart, okay? And it's a catastrophic failure of the structure. So ionic compounds are interesting because they are pretty hard until they break and then they shatter. So if you've ever noticed, if you get a big enough salt crystal and you have it between your teeth and you try to bite on it, well, it actually kind of hurts. It's actually a very hard material until you bite hard enough that it actually just shatters. So that's a good example of hard and brittle. They are composed of cations and anions. We already talked about that, pluses and minuses. They're both considered ions, positive ions and negative ions. They form salt crystals. Again, we talked about that. That's the crystal structure. And those salt crystals have an infinite size limit. Theoretically, you could get a salt crystal the size of a planet. So maybe out in space somewhere, there's a giant sodium chloride crystal floating. If it formed under the right conditions, you could have an unlimited size. It could just keep going and going. So they get to the point where they're macroscopic because we can see salt crystals. Look at a salt shaker. Each one of those is a little salt crystal. So that gets to the macroscopic scale. It's kind of interesting. But of course, inside something that you can see, you're talking about at least quadrillions of ions. So for ions of equal charge only, this last one only applies when the charges are equal but opposite, like plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two, and so on. Every ion is surrounded by six oppositely charged ions, six others. So we saw that. We saw the sodium was surrounded by six chlorides, and we could have instead picked a chloride. It might have been harder to see it, but it would be surrounded by six sodium ions, and that goes on and on and on until you get to a surface. The only place that is not true is on the surface of a crystal. But if you imagine that there's quadrillions of ions in even a small salt crystal, there's just a very, very few that wind up on a surface. And then an even more interesting situation is what happens in a corner, okay, where surfaces come together. Well, those are the ones that have the fewest bonds of all. But we'll talk about that later in a future lab. So here's the short list. Salts, that's the nickname for ionic compounds. They have high melting points. By the way, that is in front of an ionic column. Those are all ionic columns. 
Each ion is surrounded by six op oppositely charged ions. Okay, but that only works if they're equal but opposite, like plus one, minus one. They form electrolytes in solution. That's another way of saying they conduct electricity when they're in solution. And they're hard but brittle. So see how I've broken that ionic column? So the ionic columns, well, they're also very hard. They've held up ruins, Greek ruins, for centuries, millennia. But eventually, you know, there could be an earthquake. They fall over and break. I saw the ones in Olympia where the Olympics were founded. And those have all fallen over. So eventually, they can shatter. But while they last, they're very hard materials. And this goes for all ionic compounds. And yes, you did hear a cation in the background. So this brings us to one of the families on the periodic table. One of the most important families on the whole periodic table. Definitely one of the top three families, if you had to pick favorites. The family is called the halogens. Halogen means salt maker. Gen means maker of, like your progenitors or your parents, right? Your ancestors. And halo comes from halite, which is another name for salt. So they're makers of salt. And this includes chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, acetine, and now tennessine was a recently uh, discovered element. So halogens are found in most salts. Most of the time when you have a salt, it's going to contain a halogen. Let me point out that many pr people pronounce this word halogen. Now that is perfectly acceptable. I'm not saying that they're wrong. If you want to pronounce it that way, that's up to you. I know that I have a few ways that I pronounce things that are unique, let's just say, uh, the way I grew up. Like, for example, the way I pronounce the word electricity. I know it's a C, but I pronounce it as if it were a Z. It's more onomatopoetic. It sounds like zzz, zzz, electricity. Anyway, so even though I know that that's how it's spelled, I still pronounce it the way I do. And there's lots of words if you think about it. Vegetable, we don't pronounce that how it's spelled. Iron. So I feel justified in pronouncing it my way. But again, halogen is what I call it. Many others would call it halogen. Very important family on the periodic table. Now, we are going to learn later on a lot, a lot, lot, lot about covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are different. They're not ionic bonds. They found a different way of satisfying the octet and that was by sharing, isn't that nice? But I don't wanna get into too much about what they are. I just wanna point out that they're different from ionic bonds. Covalent bonds are found, for example, in water. We have a totally different way of representing them. I don't wanna explain this right now. I'm just gonna show you that we represent them like this. So that would be a water molecule, for example. We show it very differently. I'll explain this later. Don't worry about it. The point is covalent bonds are found in water. So between that O, oxygen, and the two H's, the hydrogen, that's where you find a covalent bond. That's one of the most common covalent bonds that you're going to come across. Okay. And it's kind of shaped like a Mickey Mouse head. So if you like Mickey Mouse, think about it as being shaped like his head. If you don't like Mickey Mouse, we'll think about it as sort of a decapitated Mickey Mouse head. Everybody wins. So it's shaped like that. And they've done a lot of puns about this at Disneyland. If you look around, they put in all these like little water molecule shapes. And there's all kinds of things they've, they've built off of this coincidence. I think it was a coincidence. I don't believe that Ub Iwerks, when he created Mickey Mouse, was actually trying to replicate a water molecule. Oh, I just got controversial. Uh-oh. Anyway, that's a water molecule. So when we talk about water, we're talking about a whole bunch of these molecules. And for now, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to put them all sort of nice and tidy organized. Now, in real water, they would be all over the place in different angles. But just so you can see them, I'm putting them nice and neat and tidy. OK. And then we've got a nice, neat and tidy salt crystal. Now, remember. I'm not faking this one. This is really what it looks like. When they zoom in as close as they can get, 
with an electron microscope and they can see the structure of a salt crystal. They can also see the structure from a scatter pattern of light, okay, uh, from diffraction and scattering. It really is just like this. It doesn't have the letters written on it. It doesn't have those colors, but it's exactly like this. So I'm not even, this is not even cartoony in this case, not even fudging at all. And of course it's layer after layer, as you know. So what happens if you put sodium chloride, a salt crystal with all those layers into water? Well, you probably already know what happens. You've probably taken salt, a salt shaker, and shaken it over some water. You've probably seen what happens, okay? You know what happens, right? Which one wins the fight? Who wins? Sodium chloride, does it stay together? And does it destroy the water around it? Or does the water win the fight? Does the water shred apart the sodium chloride, dissolving it? Well, I think, I think I've given away the answer, haven't I? There's another layer, another layer. You know the answer, the water wins. It shreds apart the sodium chloride, separating it into its separated ions, okay? Which is an emergency, apparently. So when you separate sodium from chloride, Technically, that's no longer salt. That's no longer an ionic compound. What that actually is, is separated ions. We call those electrolytes, okay? So that's what it meant back on the slide where it said they form electrolytes in solution. Well, there you go. So when we say salt water like this, this we would call this salt water. Technically, it's not. Technically, there's another cation, technically, it's electrolyte water. It's got separated ions, cations and anions, and the water has won the fight. It has ripped them apart. So which kind of bond would you say is stronger? Would you say an ionic bond is stronger or a covalent bond is stronger? Just judging by this result, let's say this was the fight, water versus salt, who won? And what kind of bond did that person have or that I'm, this is a bad metaphor, that molecule have. Well, clearly the water won. So that means that covalent bonds are actually stronger than ionic bonds. Interesting, interesting, interesting. However, guess what? If you do some research online, Google it, you might get exactly the opposite information. And this is because it's complicated. Ionic bonds individually are kind of flimsy, kind of weak. Between one sodium and one chloride, pretty weak. Even between one sodium and two chlorides, still pretty weak. Even one sodium and three chlorides, that's still weaker than what you have in water. But if you add up all the ionic bonds in a salt crystal, all six of them in every direction around each ion, well, that is really strong. That actually is stronger than a covalent bond because you don't have one ionic bond, you have six, six times as strong, right? So how does water manage this then? How is water able to win? Well, remember, water doesn't go to the middle of the crystal and start fighting with those guys. It starts on the outside of the crystal, on the very surfaces, especially on the corners. Remember that if you're at a corner of a cube, then you're really on the outside of everything. You don't have all of those connections to, let's say, the other ions inside. So on the surfaces, they're already missing some, and at the corners, they're missing even more. So usually at the corner, you might be attached to maybe two or three other ions. So the water, that's easy pickings. The water just goes and pulls it off. Water likes to grab things that have charges. We'll learn about that later. And then, well, guess what? Now there's a new corner. It grabs that one, and it works its way, usually from the corners and the surfaces, working its way through the crystal. That's why if you want to dissolve a salt crystal faster, you stir it around, agitate it, break it up into chunks. You've got more corners, more surfaces, and it happens much, much faster when it dissolves. So water really couldn't beat a full-on fight against six ionic bonds at once. So it couldn't just jump into the middle and rip the crystal apart. But as long as it works its way in from the outside, it can take apart almost any ionic compound. Let's just say many, many, many ionic compounds. 
That's the end of the notes on ionic bonds. There are many, many more things we will learn about ionic bonds, but that will be in future notes.